So the question is, are they operating now? They being FPP, they are. Um, since the film was made, they've uh, joined forces with the YWCA of Portland, um, and they have uh, still, you know, the struggle every two years to to find funding, and uh, they're in the midst of that struggle now. Um, the women in the film um, have all been released, uh, and uh, they got a grant to travel around the state and show the film and then do Q&As afterwards, and they've been doing that for like the last six months. So. so the question is, are there similar uh, projects at other correctional facilities? Uh, not that I know of. Um, you know, part of my motivation in making the film was that uh, it seems like such a replicable program that other places could do that, but you know, as far as I know, that that hasn't happened yet. Yes. So the question was: Is the program available to any moms with children? Uh, no, there there are um, some qualifications in terms of. Uh, like distance living from the prison and, you know, uh, kind of some logistics because they have a limited number of spaces. And if it's, uh, you know, if, if the family is like, you know, five hours away, it just doesn't usually work out logistically. So there, there are some uh, qualifications to, to be a participating family. Yes. Why is it so hard to get the funding? Um, that's a great question, and uh, I, I got to tell you, wh while I was making the film, um, and and was granted, you know, great access by the Department of Corrections, for which I'm so grateful. But when then they decided to cut the funding, um, and believe me, I'm no budget expert, but I think like the the budget for corrections is something like two billion dollars a year, and, and we're talking about th that number four hundred thousand. By the way. From, from what I saw, sounds kind of inflated. Uh, but I mean, that's literally kind of paperclip money, you know? And uh, when you see the profound impact that the program has, not only on the women, uh, but on their families and on the community, it just seems like, you know, it would be money well spent to not only, you know, maintain this program, but expand it to every correctional facility in the state. Um, and it's frustrating when, uh, you know, there had to be such a, I mean, like, such a huge grassroots movement just to maintain the program, you know. It, it seems like if our focus were more on rehabilitation and just kind of effective programs, that this would, you know, be funded, you know, all the time. And, and, and also that the Family Preservation Project wouldn't have to spend so much uh, just kind of psychic energy every two years trying to find the funding, you know. That takes its toll, yes. Um, th there is. I, I don't have that like handy, but um, out of the like all the women that have gone through FPP, the program's about ten years old. I think like literally two ha have recidivated, and like if you put that down to a percentage, it, it's like in the low single digits. Whereas if you just look at the general, you know, prison population, of course that number is you know much much higher and. You know, I'd I'd love to have a uh, a dollar amount put on that success rate, and you know, the I mean, not only just the human misery, but also just the cold cash that that saves the state. You know. Yes. Are there similar programs for men? Uh, again, not not that I know of. Um, you know, every time we show the film, that one of the first questions is, how come they don't have that at OSP? Or you know, when they they should. You know, it's fantastic. It, Jessica, who founded the Family Preservation Project, told me that for a lot of families, uh, you know, they are kind of so hard hit that, that like some of the stumbling blocks to prison visits uh, would just be the cost of gas or the lack of an alarm clock or, uh, you know, we would need someone to watch our other kid for the three hours. And what I didn't show in the film, but is that there's a little uh, kind of gatehouse uh, adjacent to the prison where the family... Uh, that's not visiting the kid can go and eat and relax and kind of be nurtured, 
you know, which is like a, a caregiver respite kind of thing, you know, and that's crucial for these families too because, you know, so many of them um, are just, you know, scrambling to get by and then suddenly they have another child or two or three to take care of because this family member has been incarcerated. You know, it's it just, it, it's a, you know, quite a burden for a lot of these families. Yes. It does. Uh, it also um, provided some early childhood education as well. So it, it was just such a, uh, a boon to these families. And then also just the feeling of support and, and kind of um, self-empowerment. You know, what I loved about the women is that they uh, held each other accountable and held themselves accountable. And that also extended to kind of their, their families that participated in the project. And there was just kind of a, a strength that happens I mean, it's kind of similar to recovery where people are able to talk about, you know, what does it mean to have a loved one incarcerated? You know, it's kind of such a stigma-filled proposition. It's not something that people talk about in kind of normal settings easily, and it was great for them just to kind of find each other and, and be a resource for each other. Yes. That's a great question. Uh, so the question was, when the program was uh, shut down for a little bit or reduced, uh, was there any tracking to see, uh, was there a negative impact on the, um, on the inmates? And not that I know of, you know. But uh, you can imagine what, what it meant for the kids, you know, to not know if they were going to get to see their mom. And, you know, it seems like we would, we would really prioritize that mother-child relationship as a kind of carrot for rehabilitation, for good behavior. Um, yeah. So, yes, Carolyn. Who would pay for the permanent funding, where it would come from? Uh, I guess it would come from the legislature and, you know, specifically from corrections budget. Yes. Right. Yes. That's a very good question. The question was basically, you know, why I'm paraphrasing, but you know, why is it so expensive to have th this program? Um, and that number is what uh, the department, I, I was on Think Out Loud, the OPB show, with uh, Katrina, who uh, is one of the moms there. She had just been released a week earlier, and then suddenly she's on Think Out Loud, like literally kind of dueling with the head honcho from the Department of Corrections over the, like the budgetary. <laughs> it's kind of great. Um, but look, they kept on throwing out these these numbers, and you know, I, I would just kind of persistently say, I'm sorry, I just don't believe that number, you know, because the program is like one and a half people, and it's not like they're making this exorbitant salary. I mean, I think it's money well spent, and they, you know, DOC was trying to act like it was, you know, we just can't afford it. Um, you know, so I, I don't want to kind of represent their viewpoint because I, I don't know it, um, but you know, it, it, just, it seemed like they were looking for a, a reason, a rationale to shut the program down that really had nothing to do with the efficacy, uh, efficacy of the program or, or even actually the money. It was just more like a, a decision that somehow, and this is my opinion, but that this program did not represent what DOC wanted to be about. And, and this, again, my opinion, they wanted to be about punishment, not rehabilitation. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. So just to be clear, the, the, the children do have the right to visit their, their mom or dad in a kind of traditional prison visit, which, uh, depending on the institution, is oftentimes through plexiglass, has an armed guard, uh, is oftentimes in a very chaotic, loud environment where uh, the average child is going to feel very intimidated and not, you know, kind of nurtured and, and not really able to kind of connect with their parents. So th this is a you know, a special visit above and beyond that that would happen every other Saturday for three hours. Yes.
right. Absolutely. Yes, uh, so Mary's question was, do these women, were they in the general population, and then they, would they have these visits in a special setting? And, and yes, there was a resource room that was set up. It was carpeted. The thing I loved about it was that if you didn't know you were in a prison, just looking in that room, you wouldn't necessarily think, oh, I'm in a prison. And uh, just a little side note, uh, it, it, it's a big deal to shoot in a prison. Like every piece of equipment has to, I have to give them the serial number, and I have to go through all these uh, like hallways and, you know, uh, metal detectors and it was amazing just to kind of uh, like sit in these kind of waiting room like areas and just notice like how much of the um, like bulletin board stuff was all about uh, the privatization or basically of communicating the communication between inmates and people on the outside you know it's like a company advertising a, a pay card or you know and it just seems like in my viewpoint here's this already hard hit population that then becomes like this cash cow for <laughs> this other you know form of capital. It just didn't seem right. Yes. Oh, oh so uh, her point was that uh, at the state hospital, Oregon State Hospital, there isn't a program that allows children to come and visit uh, a loved one who's in the hospital. Not in a. Not in a right. Yeah. So the question was was is there a, a level of privilege the women have to be at to participate in the program, and, and there is. Um, and uh, the women are so motivated by these visits and also the phone calls that you saw, which can happen like daily, which is just like a huge breakthrough because if you aren't given that, um, that privilege, uh, it can be prohibitively expensive to make those phone calls. Uh, I mean, it's such a kind of carrot that th th they don't even have to like worry about the behavior stuff because it just goes away because they're so motivated, you know, to kind of keep their record clean so they can see their kids. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Right. And uh, Jessica Katz of the Family Preservation Project has all kinds of data like that. Um, yeah, since the film's been made, uh, there's been some kind of longitudinal studies, and I think maybe even by PSU, so that, you know, they kind of have all the, uh, all the numbers that, you know, kind of uh, legitimize what we just saw, <laughs> you know, that it, it does make a huge difference. Yes, Jay. Thank you. Well, so Jay's question was, how many shooting days did I have uh, inside? And, and it was interesting because um, I was allowed to shoot um, every other week the visits that they would have. The, the visits happened twice a month. Um, <laughs> but what happened, and I'd always have to be shadowed by this very nice woman named Vicki Reynolds who works at Coffee Creek. And uh, But what would happen... Um, as soon as I kind of became public about advocating that this program shouldn't be closed, suddenly, like, I would show up to shoot, and, and I, I don't in any way mean that I have anything against Vicki. She's a lovely person, but suddenly Vicki wouldn't be there. Like, she would have been told she has to go somewhere else. In other words, like, they were making it very difficult for me to shoot after a while, which was really frustrating. Um, but I had great access, uh, you know, up, up until about the midway point, and then it got very kind of contentious. Uh, but I was allowed to shoot uh, 20 different times in the prison, you know, for which I'm, you know, very grateful and uh, so grateful to the participants for sharing, you know, their, their stories. Yes. So the question was, where did the motivation for the film? Um, 
I love to make films about people that are um, engaged in some kind of uh, process that allows them to kind of forget that I'm there with a camera. And it seemed like, uh, you know, the the parental drive to love their child would be enough for the, the women to kind of forget I was there. And it, that was my experience, that, you know, I could be right next to them and they were so focused on, you know, reading or whatever that they forgot I was there. And I love that that kind of focus, you know, it really allows me to kind of be a fly on the wall and, and just go into it. But uh, then on, on a larger thing, um, you know, inmate mom, I can't think of a more loaded uh, phrase in terms of stigma and judgment. And, you know, I just wanted to kind of challenge that and, and um, you know, follow the story and, and see for myself, you know, what that really meant. You know, and it was uh, a privilege to be let in. Yes. I don't think that they're allowed to um, because everyone ha had about the same sense. And I think actually that might be one of the requirements of the program. Uh, I think that the rationale for that is um, that there's this limited space and the idea that, that, that they're hopefully um, kind of building this relationship between parent and child that, that can then happen on the outside you know, fairly quickly. It's a great question. Yes, Jay. They would be Jessica Katz, and uh, you know she's just amazing. She uh, founded the program and has uh, you know made sure that it continues to get funding, and she advocates you know for it, and uh, just makes such a difference you know in the lives of, of the women. I'm also just amazed how she can function in all these different settings. You know, like I, I didn't, I wasn't able to show it in the film, but you know, not only does she do a great job inside the walls at Coffee Creek, but then she goes to the legislature, <laughs> you know, and, and talks to them and helps make the funding happen, you know. I mean, she's able to just really, you know, advocate and, you know, make meaningful change. Yes. Yeah, you know, I wish I could be more uh, exact about that, but I know that a lot of the families... Um, you know, are, are struggling with poverty and, and other issues. And uh, the program helped them uh, not only pay for child, early childhood education, but even like supply uh, transportation. And sometimes just like, you know, having someone that can take the child and return them, you know, just makes all the difference in the world. And uh, uh, yeah, th they do that. <laughs> yes, Carolyn. Right. That's a great question. So Carolyn was asking about the re-entry uh, re program. And uh, one of the women in the film, um, I followed a, on her release day because I thought that could be part of the story. Um, and I must admit, like, I'm, I'm as naive a, a, as any one in the general public, you know, population. I thought that there was, like, you know, they it would take care of this, that there would be, like, someone waiting at the gate. And, you know, and it wasn't like that at all. It was, like, Lynetta with a cardboard box uh, getting a ride to her parole officer. And then that's it. And I, I, f I realized very quickly that my presence, like, it wasn't helping Lynetta, me filming it. it. I think she felt, like, responsible, like she was supposed to know what to do or something. And so I just, you know, I said, look, it, I'm not going to film you because I, I don't want to add to this. But it was uh, it was sobering to to see that, you know. I mean, she there wasn't a lot of support, and you know, I, I hope that's changed, but I don't know if it has or not.
makes a lot of sense. Um, Piper Kerman, who wrote Orange is the New Black, uh, there was a fundraiser for FPP recently, and, and she talked, and uh, she's a wonderful speaker, and she told this amazing story that um, she was, uh, she did some kind of a, a drug smuggling thing one time in her youth where she like took a suitcase from some city to another city and gave it to someone or something. I mean, it wasn't like, uh, I mean, you know, she definitely did that, but it was like a one-time thing. Anyway, you know, fast forward like 10 years and there's a knock at the door and, you know, it's the FBI. And to make a long story short, she like ends up doing federal time. And uh, when she was getting out, she told this amazing story of how uh, they picked her up from the prison and took her to a Chicago jail. And um, she was there for like two weeks and they would never tell her when her release date was. And then one morning at like 4 a.m., they come and get her, um, and she's uh, given like a box of men's clothing because that's all they had. Um, and it's the Chicago winter, <laughs> and sh so she's like wearing this ill-fitting, you know, strange outfit. And they walk her down a hallway and open a door, and that's her release. <laughs> you know, she's like on the streets of Chicago. They gave her $20. And, you know, luckily for Piper, she had a devoted boyfriend who had the drive and the uh, means to come and pick her up. But imagine if you don't have that situation and you're released with $20 uh, in a Chicago winter. Uh, you know, it's scary. Yes. Um, I just want to quickly say, I, a lot of you are probably in um, positions where a, a filmmaker or writer, or whomever, asks you permission, you know, to maybe follow what goes on with what you do. And uh, I just want to urge you to maybe consider saying yes, because I think these stories need to get out. And uh, it's sometimes frustrating as a filmmaker to um, feel like uh, uh, that there's some stories that I don't get to tell because, not because the person who it's really about doesn't want to participate, but because people that are kind of in some ways control of controlling that person don't want that story to get out and it can be frustrating. <laughs> That's my little pitch. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, working uh, on a project at McLaren. McLaren has the only, it's the uh, youth prison in Woodburn, has the only, uh, incar or only marathon for incarcerated youth in America. <laughs> and it happens every April. Um, and, you know, because it has to obviously be within the prison walls, they uh, have figured out this kind of crazy loop that they have to do 17 and a half times so that it equals 26.2 miles. And I've been following that. And I gotta tell you, I've just been so impressed with OYA. And uh, the focus is on rehabilitation and just the, you know, you, you get a feeling when you walk in a, an institution, you know, and the feeling you get at McLaren is like one of hope. And not to be uh, negative, but at DOC or at uh, Coffee Creek, besides the Family Preservation Project, I can't say like, you know, hope was a thing that I encountered a lot. So it's really refreshing to kind of feel that. Yes. I think that's part of the difference, but I also just think that um, I think OA has a different culture and philosophy, you know, and you, you feel it in the way that the people interact with the young men. But, but, but the sobering thing is that all these young men, if they have sentence remaining at age 25, and so many of them do, then they get sent to a DOC. And um, it's almost like you can see it in their eyes when they get to be about 24 and the, the thought of like, oh, wow, in about a year, I'm not going to be here. I'm going to have to go to this unknown thing where I probably don't get to have the industrial arts class or go to college or uh, get my certificate to be a physical trainer or work with the dogs that come in every day that I train so that they can then be adopted by other people on the outside. You know, all these programs they have probably aren't available to them in the adult facility, you know, and it's, uh, 
it's really sobering. Two of the young men I'm following are making clemency pleas to have a, uh, a second look. You know, the idea being that when they finish their OYA sentence at age 25, can they at least have the possibility of having, a, a, I don't even know what, who the, what the mechanism would be, but having a review of w their progress and, you know, at least the possibility that, you know, if, if a, a, a jury, whoever it would be, would look at them and say, like, we truly believe you've rehabilitated, you've done your time, we don't feel like you, it's in the public interest for you to go to an adult prison now, you, you can be free, you know? So wouldn't that be great? We'll see if that happens. Yes. I agree. Yes. Oh, thank you. I love that idea of asking for a tour. I mean, I mean uh, my uh, when we were trying to advocate for keeping FPP, I, I just kind of had this idea, not not that it's unique to me, but just this kind of you know obvious idea that these are public institutions that should be they should answer to us, right? I mean, if and and I think that we sometimes forget about that, you know, that you know that they need to be held accountable. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, it's distributed by Dark Hollow Films. It's an educational distributor. 
Anything else? Well, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much.